A warm welcome to Lost for Words, a podcast exploring the opinions, glories and the most interesting stories of guests. I am your host Jason and this is episode 13, however I can assure you there is no bad luck about this week. I am joined by Colette Mullen who is the owner of Esperanza Style, a Glasgow based fashion boutique. Colette speaks to me on today's episode about her experience at university, graduating with a first class degree in international fashion branding, despite calling into question the usefulness of many elements of her studies. She speaks about living abroad for a semester in Spain, learning about Spanish fashion, and then the grind of the limited graduate jobs here in Scotland. Colette discusses the positions she has held in the industry before we take a deep dive into all things Esperanza style. Colette speaks in detail about the highs and lows of being a sole trader and the challenges she faces as a small business owner, all the while remaining positive. This one comes in at a little over an hour. It is a very interesting listen. I will speak to you on the other side. A quick housekeeping note before we get started. Please leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, whether that be Apple, Google, Spotify, Podbean or any other platform. It's the best way the podcast can grow and better content can be produced for you, the listener. It's your listening experience that matters the most. But enough from me, now on to today's episode of Lost for Words. Hi Colette, welcome aboard. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. No, don't be silly. Pleasure's mine. Anyway, I will just cut straight to the chase. We're obviously we're here to talk about uh, fashion and what fashion is to you, but if we go back to when you were at school, did you tailor your sort of subject choices around having a view to go into something to do with fashion? So, yeah, I'd definitely say from like third year you know when you had to kind of pick your subjects and like start studying for your standard grades it kind of just turned me into a little bit of a geek like I always knew from like third and fourth year that I wanted to firstly do well in my standard grades so I could then take hires and then go to uni so yeah I would definitely say that I did school didn't really come like as easy to me as it did to other people but I definitely had to try that a little bit harder to kind of do well and kind of make sure that I could then go on to take hires and things like that so I would definitely say that I stuck in (laughs) if you can say that. Would you say there was anything sort of from your time at school that would have predicted where you are now? Um, I'd say maybe like just trying like maybe if you got like a few bad grades it would just kind of like make you realise like okay I do need to try hard like the pressure I always knew that I wanted to go to uni so even like third year I would just say I remember getting like I failed what was it like I remember in first year actually I was in the very lowest class for maths I was like this is not happening like I am actually going to try in school like it was just so embarrassing to remember like being in the lowest math class, I was just like, no, a change needs to happen here. I'm not going through school being in the lowest class. Like, I just found it quite embarrassing. So I think that gave me a kind of kick in the right direction to kind of pull my socks up. <laughs> so I remember when it was when we started high school for maths. It was for maths. Mm-hmm. And they actually sat everybody down and everybody did the same test. Yeah. And then they actually told, they actually told you, right, yeah. you're going into the top uh-huh. one. And I just think, <laughs> like, math, like, huh? people, like, in your whole year would kind of identify you as, <laughs> as stupid if you were in the, in the lowest math class. So it was a bad start to my high school, um, like, career, if you could say that. But I just knew that I couldn't go on like that. So... I think I studied maths extra hard in in first year, (laughs) way back then. (laughs) So then you're talking about um, third year. Did you choose, at that time, um, did you choose subjects that would have reflected your current career trajectory? Um, So probably, yeah. Like even in third year, 
I remember you had to pick a science and I was so annoyed at having to pick a science. Like, I just didn't want to. Um, I just wanted to do, like, kind of, like, business subjects. I wanted to do art. I didn't even really want to pick, like, um, remember you had to pick, like, geography or history or modern studies. I was just concerned. I done modern studies, but, um, yeah, I didn't really have much interest in, in those subjects. I was just mostly, like, art admin accounts and then we went on to hires it was more like business management accounts and all that as well so yeah I would say that they were all kind of um helpful and kind of directing what route I went down with uni course and career etc but you're obviously so young to decide what you want to do but I think you just kind of go with what you like at the time <laughs> absolutely absolutely See, when you think back to when you were at school um, and you would have said to the teachers or you would have had a chat with your guidance teacher yeah, about the, the direction you wanted to go yeah, in. definitely. Um, did, was that, like, did, did your guidance teacher and the teachers present your current career path as one that would have been attainable or advisable? Um, no. So I actually didn't really hear or know of anyone like you know how you're always kind of concerned what the year above you was going on to do and that I didn't really know anyone that had done fashion branding or that but um all the typically smart people in my year were obviously um going on to their choices were widely known that they were going to do like law and accounts and economics at Strathclyde but I feel like maybe because I was like one of the first and so my sister didn't go to uni um, and because I knew that I wanted to go to uni I kind of put more like research into what it was I wanted to do but yeah I definitely would say my teachers and that were not very I don't because fashion it just wasn't something that came up like when they would kind of give like general chats and like courses or that it was just mostly like the main unis like Strathclyde, Glasgow, like Cali was never really mentioned. So I think just for me doing my kind of research and what it was I wanted to do, I didn't really I didn't really consider their opinion. I was like that, I'm going to uni, that should be good enough, kind of. <laughs> what other quote unquote safer options were you encouraged to go with at that time? Um I would say like probably like teaching and stuff like that were always your kind of more mentioned choices at uni so like I don't know like because of the subjects I picked I would say it did kind of limit my choices a bit um and they, they kind of did say that like um I could have only really done like social science they kind of um uni-based courses like I didn't because I didn't do any of my sciences or languages I was quite restricted to be fair um for like teaching courses and that so I would say that maybe they did kind of point me in the direction of a kind of typically not lower class course but I don't know like typically less academic course if you could say that got you got you then tell me what you so what uni you went to and what you studied and as well as your final grade if you want to say okay so yeah I done fa international fashion branding at Glasgow Caledonian and I somehow managed to actually get a first class but I don't know some people have said that getting a first class at Cali is easier <laughs> than getting a first at like Strathclyde or Glasgow or that but I'm still going to take um, it <laughs> no that's nonsense take take your you deserve the credit for that don't don't let anybody it, take, it take the credit come as quite a shock to be fair like I was on track for a 2-1 and the day that I got my results through I was like is that actually real so yeah it was a nice surprise to be fair Good for you, good for you. How would you summarise your experience of uni? Um, I really enjoyed uni. Like, I think it was the fastest four years of my life, like, because it's kind of split into two semesters of 12 weeks. Like, it just goes so, so fast. And, like, 
you don't need I was full time but obviously like I was one of those ones who got the timetable where it was like um most days but only for a few hours each day so that like, you were there all the time um I really enjoyed the four years like I think that it was a really broad course so like in first year obviously you're doing like so many subjects like things that you're just never really going to do again like I can't even remember like we had to do this module called oh, I can't even remember what it stood for but I know it was called like boss or something and it was just so so strange like you had to go and do like tours of Glasgow and all that like it was so so weird Um, I think it was just to kind of settle you into uni life but as the years went on I think they done kind of more beneficial things but I don't know like I do have quite strong opinions on it wasn't um interactive enough in the sense that you didn't get much chance to put anything you were learning into practice like we did um live industry projects with like we worked with like quiz um and turtle a travel company thing and you would kind of like pitch your ideas to the the owners or like um employees of the businesses but I just feel like from like as a struggling graduate I think that uni you would benefit so much more from actually doing like work experience like you know like nurses do placements I think that's something that my course really really needs to introduce because then you would learn what kind of things you're good at on on an actual job and what kind of route you want to go down so I definitely think that uni has got to kind of update itself a bit for like getting students ready for the actual real world rather than doing so much so much theory-based learning rather than practical learning so I would definitely give them feedback on that and I don't think my tutor is very happy about that I've been quite vocal on LinkedIn about the struggle to kind of find a graduate job when businesses are at fault as well for wanting um uh, individual to do like five roles in one when uni doesn't even really properly prepare you to do one role so how can you be expected to do five <laughs> so yeah quite a strong opinions on that one <laughs> but that's it's fair though because like when I think of me so I, I'm I do teaching Colette and I was so I went to uni for four years mm-hmm. and say when you do your teaching placement say six seven weeks at a time yeah um and you you learn more in that, those six seven week blocks than you do for the the the, the, the three years that go before that exactly you learn so much on the job of course yeah it just is so overwhelming for like graduates even thinking about do like being in that situation so i think that they should definitely my advice to that course would be like even not even a placement but like even choose some a subject in fourth year that you want to specialize in and just learn so much more about that role rather than have such like small little knowledge of each different kind of fashion fashion uh, role that there that is there like we kind of learned say for example a fashion buyer we learned more about what a fashion buyer is rather than how to be a fashion buyer. So I don't know how that actually makes any sense, but I think it was just the name of the course, like fashion branding. Although you can get these jobs like a buyer, an allocator, a merchandiser, you're not going to know much about how to actually be that. You're just going to know about the brand. Say you you are one of those roles for a brand you're going to know more about like the branding behind that company rather than the actual role so yeah it's quite a complex um industry <laughs> that is what i wanted to ask so as you were a final year student so say you're you're doing your honors year mm-hmm. what are the general employment prospects for an international fashion branding student see i was actually 
so overwhelmed in fourth year, like with the amount of stuff going on, like all the different projects, your dissertation. Like I didn't spend near enough time as I should have looking for a gadget job because I kind of would like, I've obviously had LinkedIn for a good few years, even when I was at uni, but I would like occasionally just type in like fashion jobs, Glasgow, and like no results would come up. Like very like, or if they did come up, they would be manager or senior roles. So I just kind of was like, mm, "This is really stressing me out." So I'm going to put it off, try and focus on getting a good grade, and then deal with that later. That's obviously, I would say, after graduating, that is one of the I looked back and thought that that was maybe a mistake that like I should have kind of, um, like made my job hunting an ongoing task but you just kind of get caught up in the final year as pressures are high so yeah um the job process I think that a lot of people in my course like while they were in their four years at uni they kind of kept the one part-time job like for example coast although that's no longer trading like one of my friends worked at coast and they knew that she was um that she was like near graduating so then they then sent her to like London and she kind of got her foot in the door that way but for people that I I kind of had a lot of um different retail jobs so I didn't really stay within the one company so my options were quite limited <laughs> for international fashion branding so by that word international mm-hmm. would most of the jobs in this country generally be London based yeah I would say so like I kind of knew that before I'd done the course and it was something that kind of put me off I was like that it is going to be so difficult for me to get a job in Glasgow should I just do something else but I was like I'll think about it near the time so I kind of did always have in the back of my head like I will need to relocate but London is just extremely extremely expensive and like you're still not guaranteed I don't know like even Manchester is still so expensive to move so when you've just graduated gathering the money after taking SAS out and everything and you've not saved up it's so hard so you do I that's why I kind of done other jobs because I was maybe planning maybe considering moving to London but yeah the international part of the course also comes from like we got to do Erasmus and I was lucky enough to go to Madrid in my third year um, for a semester so that was really great and um, just learning um, so much about Spanish fashion to be honest and um, I think that was definitely my highlight of the course and the international part of it. Um, How does Spanish fashion differ from UK fashion? Um, I don't know like we had our lecturers in Spain were just it was just so different the teaching like we kind of done um like just really different classes like um we were taught more by industry professionals which I really really liked rather than lecturers we were taught by um like just people that had their own companies and just were so knowledgeable um rather than people that have been standing in front of a although some lecturers are um at Cali did work in the industry before but I just feel like Spanish uni is a lot more um modern than uh, uni in Scotland we we got to like go and visit thing uh, places um like PR agencies and I was actually lucky enough to go to Zara headquarters in uh, the north of Spain <laughs> that was one of the highlights but the whole tour was in Spanish and I obviously as I said earlier didn't um, choose Spanish as a subject in school so that was a big struggle for me learning anything there. Were most of the company leader people in Spain obviously bilingual? Um, Would they have spoken, spoken English most of them? Yeah uh uh-huh, like 
I think they said that um, if you were to work at Zara, they would maybe give you like Spanish lessons and that, but the majority of the staff do speak Spanish. So um, that was ob would obviously be a big stumbling block, but that was definitely, when I was there, I was like, I want to come back here and work for Zara, but things changed. You get the, get the, get the Spanish books, Spanish yeah, textbooks out before that. It was, such a big <laughs> it was literally like, uh, I think it was like seven hours from Madrid and it was literally like um, the Spanish version of Millport. Like I would have hated to live there. there was, <laughs> it was the most isolated place ever. Like the only thing that was on that kind of island, no one island, but uh, place was Zara. So it would be your work and that would be the only thing there. <laughs> That's mad. I didn't actually know Zara was a Spanish company. No, well, it was like Inditex headquarter. They have so many different brands like Stradivarius, Bershka. So, yeah, it was great insight, to be honest. Ar RTX or something in Coruña? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> my highlight of my four years. <laughs> <laughs> right, so... Um, Tell me this then, as if you were to give a first year student a bit of advice, what would their, what would your advice be? I would say definitely really identify quite early what what route you want to go down. Like some of my friends knew from day one they wanted to do fashion buying. Um I was always so uncertain. I was like, I want to do social media. Is that even a job? I was confused if that was even a job at one time, like fashion, social, me social media, because it kind of branches out into like influencer outreach, content creation, like it branches out so much. And then you've also got like the whole kind of merchandising thing, side of things, visual merchandising, online merchandising. So there is so many possibilities. So if you can decide what your strengths are, like if you're more creative or you're more numerically inclined, choose a role and kind of tailor your studying and your dissertation and the roles you take on in like group projects to kind of what that role would require of you I would definitely say that and it's something I wish I'd done <laughs> I'm very honest of you well yeah, done thanks <laughs> <laughs> so by the time you'd finished uni um, what were your ideas or principles for fashion mm. I was still kind of leaning towards the kind of creative side, like social media. Um, but I just found it like in Glasgow, it is so difficult to find a business. Like you've only really got quiz or O Poly, so that narrows your options like extremely down. And then the social media teams in these businesses are usually really small, so. I I done like an internship in my final year as well, um, a social media internship. But what I found was that it wasn't like primarily fashion orientated. And I really thought that, oh, if I want to do social media, I'm going to maybe need to end up working for like a, a skincare brand or a, a restaurant. Like, so yeah, um, my... <laughs> When I finished uni, I was a bit scunnered, to be honest. I was like, why? Why did I do this? <laughs> have I wasted my full four years? Like, should I have done something else? I was, I was a bit, when by the time I had, like, obviously you hand your dissertation in, you wait in the results and that, and I was just a bit like, what now? Do you know what I mean? I was like, I didn't really have a plan in place. I knew that it was probably going down the social media route but again it's just not specific enough and the I felt like the role I was looking for didn't really exist and it definitely didn't exist in Glasgow <laughs> but I, I kind of I applied for like a few you know that so you have when you're applying for fashion jobs there's just like these like, for example, business of fashion, that's where all the fashion jobs are. And then you filter it to location and the, the results are like, so you can search like Europe, rest of the world. And then you can search like Scotland and the results for like Europe and um, 
everywhere else would be like 50 to 100 and then you would come to Scotland and it would be like one <laughs> so I did apply for like um a few in Europe and I was just going to like think about like relocating and that if I did just to see how it would go on to be fair and I had got a few interviews but I just didn't have enough experience for it. I had, I think the most exciting interview I ever had was for my Teresa. It's like a premium kind of, um, a premium like brand based in Germany. They like stock like so many brands. It's kind of like the equivalent to like flannels or crews, but based in Germany. So um, yeah, like after that, I was just so, demotivated to be honest I was like that I'm really going to rethink my um like my goals like my route like I just was so lost to be fair when I did finish I just didn't know what to do next I was just applying for everything and anything just to kind of get the ball rolling if you get me got you I've got you and you were saying that you started off working at a you did manage to get a boutique in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, but it was primar- primarily aimed at an older target market. Yeah, so that was kind of through. Um, I had mentioned I'd done a social media internship. So um, this boutique was like a client for the owner of the social media internship agency. So she managed to get me a job um, working for them. But um, yeah, I, I learned quite a few things. It was quite a short-lived experience, to be honest. Um, I was like, it was a very, very small team. So the, the role that they were looking for was someone to do everything. And by everything, I mean everything like designing a set for like photo shoots. Um, so basically being an interior designer. <laughs> uploading products to the website so basically being like a, a web designer they also wanted me to be a photographer actually working a proper camera they wanted me to be a stylist designing all like pairing all the outfits together and like when you're working for when you're an older brand it's so it's quite difficult because you're not in that target market you don't really know what older like what older women's taste is and like when you come into a business which is like a really small business it's so hard to kind of understand the owner's vision and like their kind of brand identity like you kind of would have different ideas but they would always have done things like that one way if you get what I mean so it was it was challenging um that was my first graduate job and I was so overwhelmed I was like how can this be expected me to do so many roles and I've literally just finished uni and I was getting like eight pound an hour and just I felt just completely scunnered again I was like this why did I do this (laughs) basically um and like I was going home and like still like um uploading things to their social media like when after I went home from work so it was just so exhausting and not rewarding enough like I felt like I don't like obviously if you're working for a big company your own company you're really kind of interested and motivated but I was just like oh do you know what I mean I was just so demotivated so yeah um that kind of led me on to the next chapter (laughs) so what, what were your reasons for leaving if you had to choose one, let's say. It sounds as though you had a few. I did have a few, just been stretched in so many <laughs> so many areas and it didn't give me enough like job stability. Like I was looking for a nine five Monday to Friday, whereas they wanted me to do like just really strange hours that and then I asked them, Can like you condense my hours so I can maybe get another job and like just so I could like earn more money if you get what I mean, even though I shouldn't have to do that being a graduate, but they were basically just really not flexible flexible with that. So um I literally hand said to them on the Friday, like, I don't think like this is like what I'm looking for. And I literally it, just made up my mind I was like I'm getting another job like I didn't even think that I was going to be unemployed I applied for so many jobs on Indeed and then I had an interview on the Monday for 
PLT like and then I got the job on the Tuesday so it was a, a fast turnaround which I was so happy about. Quick little thing what was your what was your role there? Okay so I see when I was was doing that job search I was like literally nearly jumping up and down that PLT in Boohoo was based in Motherwell like that was news to me like never once did like never once was that mentioned that they have a client which is the biggest fashion retailer in the UK so I was so excited like I genuinely thought it was like a sign I was like that oh my god that's in Motherwell and like I actually never applied for something so like fast and then um it was the easiest interview I've ever had in my life (laughs) he literally asked me like um can you name I think it was like can you name three your friends I was like is this a joke is this an actual wind up and then started <laughs> on the two he's like oh, yeah you've got the job um it's just a customer service job but I thought that was like a sign like oh my god this is an entry into the the fashion world a big massive company like this is meant for me basically I really thought it would lead to amazing things but it was so mundane. It was the most repetitive job ever. Like I did really, really like it. Um, just dealing with everything, customer service related, from like late late deliveries to like disputed deliveries to God, that was really the 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 gist of it. Um, but you would do like fifteen emails an hour, and then you could be on like live chat and social media and things like that. So you weren't. It wasn't really the end goal, but I feel like the the brand kind of just made the job seem attractive. If you get what I mean, like you weren't doing anything fashion related. You were basically just a robot. But because it was PLT and I had a pink lanyard and a forty percent discount, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> is the, did you learn anything then that helped you now that, that's been beneficial for you with Esperanza um, probably just the kind of customer service delivery side of things like if somebody wants to kind of rip you off and try and say that they didn't get their order when they kind of like just kind of basic stuff like that but nothing really creative or business wise I always wanted to kind of try and get into PLT head office but it was never as easy as that they didn't see like oh she works for a customer service give her a chance um to kind of um come down to be like interviewed or that for a different department it was just like we were treated as like a, a different team and the only kind of progression you could have would be to be like a customer service team leader so it was kind of dead end to be fair like I couldn't deal with just being just talking to customers all day it was nothing really exciting about it if you get what I mean so sadly I didn't really learn much in the kind of fashion sense of things but just kind of customer service wise I think I'll always kind of know how to talk to customers how to treat like couriers things like that so a few things have kind of been beneficial but nothing nothing too exciting sadly (laughs) (laughs) You worked there, so we worked for PLT. Your employment there spanned the the start of the pandemic. So, how would you say your your final six months there go from June to December were different from the first six? Mm, so, I was only on I was on like furlough for like six weeks, and then they randomly called us, um, like just a small so like number of people on the team. They were like, "That do you want to come back to the office? Like, we'll socially distance." everyone and I was like yes like get me out of this house so I was in the office like basically most of the first lockdown which was quite bizarre because we weren't it was weird that they could kind of treat us as um like a central essential ah uh-huh, they, they did which is just bizarre because it like I think a census have being q as a client and things like Lidl so I feel like they kind of <laughs> they pulled a few strings for us to be deemed as essential when we weren't really but basically I was in the office most of the pandemic and then they kind of sent us home in October so it was away in October that we got sent to work from home got a laptop and I think that's when I completely lost motivation like I was so bored like in the house like just sign on my laptop every day and just like see because you could go on your phone as well when you're working obviously I shouldn't be admitting that but you could go on your phone while you were working 
I don't know why it just made me even more bored while I was working because like you could get your your work done within like the first kind of 20 minutes within the hour and then you had kind of 40 minutes to kind of sky so I was like that how can I use my time more productively rather than refreshing Instagram like 40 times an hour so that's kind of when things began for Esperanza when working at home meant to be work meant to be fully working I was thinking about starting my own business yeah so talk me through that how do those thoughts so what were the first thoughts that came into your head um just that right so while during the first lockdown as well um I had started the virtual styling Instagram which is Colette Styling and that just became such like a hobby like that was a big part of my day putting outfits together searching new in on um like for example PLT, Boohoo, Zara and just putting outfits together so during like when working from home I was like that I really really enjoy doing this how can I kind of make money from my like do something that I love but also make money so I was like that I enjoy like doing all the kind of branding stuff for my virtual styling account so I was like that the next move the next sensible move for me is probably to for me to make money out of this and start my own boutique like picking things that I like like I had already had like an all right following of people that kind of wanted to see the outfits I put together so yeah it just seemed like the next kind of logical move to try and make some money from it (laughs) that makes me sound like a pure (laughs) money orientated person but it was just kind of the next logical thing for me I thought and to kind of put my spare time into better use I would say so the first thing I think the first thing I'd done well the idea of like having the boutique kind of stemmed from working at the boutique that I had just mentioned the older market boutique I was like if she can do it for an older market I can do it for a younger market did that really work it because I feel like younger people shop more online they know how to shop around for bargains so I don't know if that idea really translated as well as it could have for being the basis of the kind of foundations of the business but basically I was like that it's so hard basically it's so hard to um, manufacture things like I didn't as I told you a bit about fashion branding like I didn't do fashion designer that like I couldn't draw I can't draw like it's not something that we've done at uni so I had to kind of opt for more of a, like a boutique business so the first kind of thing that I'd done was like look up suppliers oh my god it was such a struggle like I could only find like things from China that were like so bad like shocking quality I was like that I'm not going to buy like that vest top and sell it but like wish wish type standard 100% that was the only thing (laughs) I was like that I'm missing something major here so I think that's one of the tasks that I'd done while working while skiving (laughs) working from home was look for suppliers so that took me so so long like I would say a good three weeks or something like every day just typing into google rephrasing my search terms like women's suppliers blah blah blah. so I'm not going to (laughs) tell my competitors how I eventually found good ones but basically they are Paris based and Paris based and uh, another one based in Spain um so eventually found them and I was like that okay I found a good few things that I like they're all kind of the same um like aesthetic like I knew that I had to kind of stick to a theme I was so impulsive I bought the stock and then I was like that okay it's definitely happening now I need to come up with a name so the next thing I'd done was so I needed to come up with a name before I made the Instagram and things so I think it was like yeah why why is Esperanza called Esperanza okay so when I was thinking of the name I was literally just 
I think I came up with like a few random ones that didn't really have any meaning that just kind of had a nice like flow to them like really feminine names like fuchsia and things like that I think I was thinking about and then I was like that no like I want it to kind of mean something and have like a meaning behind it so I was literally in my kitchen and I was like that what is kind of relevant to starting a business in a pandemic so I was like that um what is all what is common for everyone kind of right now and I was like that we all need to have kind of <laughs> it sounds so cheesy but we all need to have hope that like things are going to get better that we're going to get out of lockdown so I was like that as you know I studied in Madrid so I obviously think I'm Spanish now. Spanish for Spanish for hope is Esperanza yeah, so yeah I actually you know I actually didn't know that meant that I had to google it I was like that what is Spanish for that and then as soon as it came up in the Google search results, I was like, oh my God, I love that word. Like it's just so feminine and nice. So yeah, that was how the name came. <laughs> nice, nice one. So see from going from the, the process of you having these thoughts on your phone to the actual launch, yeah. was, was getting suppliers the first, was that the first step? That was the first step, yeah. Then the Instagram, I would say, was the second and like Pinterest boards and stuff like that just just trying to like build a kind of aesthetic and making logos making a website oh it was it was quite uh, tedious and draining but it was fun see for people who aren't so well versed like me what does what does getting suppliers entail what does you getting a supplier actually mean is that just the stock of clothes basically yeah like finding a good website that that looks legit that it sells things you like that it delivers to the uk that it so it was actually quite there was a kind of catch to it as well like before um you had to kind of make an account to get onto these websites that you had to be a business so i <laughs> one day impuls impulsively had to register my business basically um and it's something that's causing me a bit of problems just now but that's a whole different kettle of fish um i had to register with hmrc to get a vat number so once i done that I was a business so it was much easier to, for me to find a supplier but with those three weeks that I was searching I was looking for ones that you didn't need to have an account or a VAT number so you could like sign in it's like businesses don't want you to like say for example you just entered um like fashion supplier and that some websites are like locked for you to kind of see the prices if you're just an individual so you have to make an account so that you're a business but to make a business account like you have to enter a VAT number so that was a really really big challenge for me and it's complicated things a lot <laughs> now <laughs> so uh, yeah that's what getting a supplier entails. Are you able to tell me a little bit about how that has complicated things? So it's just like when you register for VAT, you commit to, although you don't, like, there's a big massive threshold that you kind of need to earn under if you need to be registered for VAT, but I had to, like, voluntarily register for VAT. And by doing that, I now need to do, like, tax returns and things like that. And it's just so complicated. It's unreal. So I've now opened the kind of... um everything that I sell on my website I need to charge tax on and when you're such a small business charging tax obviously eats into your profits and then doing a tax return I try to do it myself and I've complicated things so I'm actually going to need to probably hire an accountant so it's it's quite it's quite a lot for a sole trader needing to do that but I don't know that's how it's complicated things it's quite stressful in your own words, what is Esperanza style? I would just say it's kind of a different take on fashion. Like, you can hunt for hours on PLT and kind of um, be landed with the kind of same styles 
but it's just kind of a fresh take on like current trends offering something a little bit different to your typical fast fashion businesses um I would only ever sell things that I would wear which is kind of the um unique selling point for me I would say like I would wouldn't buy things for my business or like design things that I didn't think that I could put on like my virtual styling page like I always have to be like that is my style I approve of that so therefore I think my customers will like it as well. So if that's your style you would you would only buy things that you would wear does that then mean the target market are a similar profile to yourself? Yeah very very similar to me and I do think I have like quite a um kind of girly like young style so obviously it does kind of limit the target market a little bit but I just found that if people were following Colette styling and they were liking the outfits I put together that that I should have kind of faith in my own kind of taste and style so yeah I just kind of target customers to have similar style to me that does limit it a bit but hey ho that's a, sh- that's a shame. Can't have me. I can't be a customer. I do apologize. <laughs> Girl, girly colours and floral. You're missing yeah. out. Yeah. I know. I know. I feel that. I feel that way. I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you market it then? Do you market it through your own Colette styling and yeah. the Instagram itself? Yeah, Instagram. It's definitely the main focus. Like I have a Facebook page and I think it's genuinely like my mum and my auntie that likes the things like our generation just are not Facebook oriented at all and um, so yeah just Instagram I'm nearly at the thousand follower mark that was probably one of my because you know like it's genuinely had around the same amount of followers since like February so I've just like not even looked at it anymore I'm like that that's not going to get the thousand mark <laughs> I've gave up with that um but Instagram is definitely the main focus um it's just so difficult though on Instagram now like they have complex algorithms and things that just do not favor small businesses at all or really anybody apart from people with like 10k followers or that so um yeah 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 I've heard you. Yeah, I've heard that before that the algorithm changes all the time, yeah. and it's hard for yeah. So like, say I have that amount of followers, like nine hundred odds, and I put a story on advertising like a product that's in a sale. Only fifty people. Instagram only shows fifty people my story. I'm like, what is the point in this? It's so difficult. So I don't need new marketing tools, but that's something I'll need to work on. <laughs> You worked with, or you work with, uh, present tense. Um, you've got influencers and or models. I don't know if I'll put yeah, them those yeah. phrases in inverted commas. How does that work? So that working was with like them? one of my like when I was launching, I was like, okay, to get the name out there, it needs to be big names. I need to gift. I had to gift products to these influencers. So that was also a big part of my launch was messaging people that would kindly accept my gift and you would be surprised of how many people want to charge of course that is their job I don't even understand that but that they want to charge you for like your clothes yeah so they want to they want you to sit like yeah get, pay them to wait yeah that's <laughs> and like in my ideal world as a business owner it is really not ideal but in their world as that some people do do that for a living so I do need to appreciate that so I was I struggled with that to be honest I was really skeptical of oh my god that did not come out right I was really like I was like not looking for people who wanted to charge me I was like that like I'm a new business I can just kind of go for kind of smaller influencers maybe they'll have more of an engaged audience so but I found it, it didn't really have like a really good return on investment. So say I was gifting an influencer a product that cost me like, I don't know, like 30 odd pound or whatever. I would obviously have to send that them that for free, pay the postage and packaging and all that. And say, for example, this girl had like 7,000 followers. She would then post a picture and wearing my item, she'd tag me and like put it on her story and things 
and like if she's got like seven thousand followers and she probably gets about a thousand likes so i was expecting oh god i was so over ambitious in the beginning i was expecting maybe like <laughs> scared to say it but like 200 odd followers or something from maybe one post (laughs) i was lucky if it got like four followers so i done i gifted so much in the start like that's how i wanted to kind of build up the following but i just got to the stage where even the the bigger ones that i did gift were just not getting me any kind of new customers or new followers so i really kind of don't don't really see the point in it anymore like so the influencer route was just not giving you any return on your investment no definitely not like it is maybe good to get the brand out there but if these people that are seeing the influencer post aren't going to follow you but I suppose you are the only other added benefit of the influence like gifting the influencer is that you do get content from it so like they create a nice picture with a nice like background so I could like put that on brands on Instagram I could put that on the website so I mean there is some definitely some pros and cons but yeah definitely just not enough return of investment for maybe other forms of marketing but I do think that the forms of marketing for a young a young like a brand that um, targets young people is really limited especially if you don't want to spend a lot of money <laughs> Interesting, interesting. So as the, obviously we're in the midst of the pandemic, as the restrictions ease, will that change your business model at all? Um, So when I launched in December, I feel like things were really optimistic. I thought that we were kind of going to be out of a kind of lockdown in January and that's why I... I, How wrong was that? I know, like... That's why I had bought like kind of dresses and things like that. Obviously, it was kind of autumn winter, so things were like dresses and what else I buy? Like at that time, it was jackets, but people don't really need a new jacket if they're sitting in their house. You know what I mean? So no matter what season that was, people were. It's a complex situation to be honest. The pandemic, like some people had so much more. A disposable income and then others were really struggling financially so it was it was difficult what view I took on it but I just kind of liked having the excuse that that was the reason that everything hadn't sold out <laughs> so um as we kind of move out of lockdown I mean I don't know like I think people do or are still buying things but it's just difficult I would say like I thought as soon as lockdown lifted even at all people would go okay I'm buying more but it's just hard because like things that I've had in stock for a good few months now like people are bored of it do you know what I mean they're not going to buy something they've seen four months ago just because we're out of lockdown so it definitely does pose some challenges I'd say that's yeah interesting interesting so just as a, a question, right, I, as again, as I say, not as a female fashion expert, um, what, how does a summer-spring collection differ from an autumn-stroke-winter? How how would you plan for that? Definitely just, like, so for Esperanza, the kind of vision I had at the start was just kind of very autumn-themed colours, like greens, browns, muted colours and that. Um, that like my logo was all green all the branding was all green but moving into spring summer I just kind of changed the whole kind of aesthetic of the Instagram everything's more pastel orientated um, and the, it kind of reflects it, the new stuff that I've bought and the new t-shirts like blue and pink t-shirts so I've like, kind of changed my logo and all the kind of feed on the Instagram um, to like blue and pink so yeah just basically colours and prints are much brighter and more girly more the kind of vision that I had always kind of more my style to be fair that's how I would sum it up I just love bright colours and florals what's your highlight been so far my highlight I really really love doing like photo shoots so like my best friend Alana shout out to her she <laughs> she's done an amazing job modeling like she was literally 
just such a natural at it. So we had the best days, like photo shooting. We just kind of obviously had to <laughs> she had to change in the car and all that but that's just model life but the days were just so fun like we were so excited like the vibes were just they were good those days <laughs> on and then like I have the kind of like studio thing in my back garden and we just and a few of my friends have kind of modeled for me and it's just so exciting like to do something that your friends actually support you like your friends support and yeah just something that you love the the photo shoots are definitely the highlight and then obviously the launch day even though it wasn't a day like I literally it was in lockdown and my sister had kindly got me like a Esperanza balloon and it suppose you could actually say it was a marketing technique like I knew that I needed to, to like see if I just put that on my Instagram story you know how many people would scroll past that? Like, oh, she's launched a business. Do you know what I mean? So I had to, I had to use a balloon as an install opportunity <laughs> and a marketing <laughs> technique. <laughs> as, as cringy as that is to say, it, it like it was an opportunity. So I posted that on um, like my own personal account, and I posted it on Collect Styling, and it was just so nice to see people like oh like good luck well done things like that so it was definitely a highlight to think that you'd done something exciting that people were actually interested in but obviously it does die down <laughs> good good and so we're, we're six months down the line just now mm. uh, where would you like we would you like Esperanza style to be in a year's time if we look forward a year um, where would you like to be hmm. so I'm actually so glad that you asked me to do this podcast because I feel that Esperanza was kind of going to a, a lower part of my priorities so um just really refocusing my goals and like trying to sell the stuff that I've been left with to do a really good spring summer collection if that sells better than autumn winter then I know that what like my strong points are what people like more um what else so obviously like the plan was to have a launch event I really wanted to have one in like Bone Bird Day um the Blytheswood because at the time you know my branding was green and that restaurant <laughs> was all greens but um so obviously like, with lockdown things that's not really on the cards so maybe for the first birthday I'm going to have an event like like can kind of cross over the launch event but as a first birthday and that will hopefully just attract like so many more um new customers so I'll make it try and make it quite big game um, invite like influencers obviously this is going to cost a lot a lot of money so it's a uh, just depending on the rest of the year's performance I, say, I suppose and then if we go back the other way mm -hmm. uh, how would you summarize the last 12 months of your life um definitely a period of change like I think that the spare time that everyone had allowed you to kind of reflect on what you wanted to do um and it just gave me the opportunity to kind of think that I wanted to do something that I enjoyed spend my time doing something that I was passionate about but um at one point I definitely did realize that it was it should be more of a kind of hobby for me rather than something I really need to stress myself out over and like make a monthly income from because when you do that like it's just it takes all the fun out of it and you just kind of lose the kind of passion and just kind of treat it as like I was so stressed out at one point after um we kind of lost our jobs at PLT when I was kind of trying to make Esperanza my full my full-time job I just it, it's too early to do that so I definitely say that 2020 was a kind of year of change but I'm so glad that if the lockdown didn't happen I don't think I would ever had the time to even think about launching a business so it was a kind of blessing in disguise at one point because I feel like people just get so accustomed to normal life that they don't even have like you're just busy all the time so I would have never really had the time to do anything like that I would have 
no, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a lockdown. So I'm grateful in some sense that it did happen. What kept you going through the, the two lockdowns? I guess that the answer to the first one could be different to the second lockdown. Do you know what? Like, the lockdowns literally blur into one in my head. I'm like, what did I do? Um, so the first one... So when was the second one start? So the, I would consider the second one would have started... Well, I would consider like, it when I was off work. So the second, the second one was from second one. I would say January to. Oh yeah, this side of the April. year. Oh, yeah, yeah, this side of the yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so like after after the new year, I was really really focused on Esperanza, um, just because we did lose our job at PLT. So I was like, oh my god, it's like happening. I need to go big or go home, basically, but. As time went on into February and things and like Nicola Sturgeon hadn't really released any kind of update or indication when things were ending. I was just like, oh, this is taking its toll like on on the business. I can't really keep going. So I kind of did lose a bit of motivation in the second lockdown for sure. Right. And you were saying there you, you lost your job at PLT, but you've now got a new a new job. So tell me about tell me about your new one. Tell me about your new one. So it was actually, I was so, so sad when we lost our job at PLT. It was basically like, as I said, I w- it was very repetitive, but I was just like so complacent, if you get what I mean. So like, um, basically they lost the contract, the company moved to the Philippines. They did actually ask us if we wanted to relocate to the Philippines. I was like, um, I might think <laughs> about it, but no. <laughs> Actually, it was genuinely that kind of lost. I just lost. Uh, I just lost launched Esperanza, and that was the only thing that was keeping me here. Or I would have genuinely been to the Philippines <laughs> for a customer service job. Um, but after, so they kind of offered us a job at another like campaign, and I <laughs> I worked at B and Q for a day, and I quit. I was like, I can't do this. That was like the other like campaign within a census so I made the brave choice to become unemployed and really try and focus on finding because like see when you are working in a call center it does kind of affect your kind of self-worth you feel that you've not really achieved anything like after four years of uni you're like oh god I need to tell people I work in a call center do you know what I mean so I was like it's time it's time to move on although I've got Esperanza it's not enough for me to survive on like all my friends are earning big like salaries like I can't really make my business like make me I can't live on how much money this earns or the business will not get anywhere because I would need to take a salary from it on do you know what I mean so I was like that I need to find a grad job a good job that I feel proud of like the t- that was always my main goal how sad is that to update my LinkedIn status to something actually like meaningful <laughs> I was so buzzing when I could put that on so I went for a good few interviews so I felt not maybe three or four like they were all like kind of really broad as I said when I finished uni I knew like fashion would be so difficult to get into so it was like digital marketing social media I went for an interview at an opticians really did not get good vibes didn't get that interview um that interview wasn't successful and then I went for one at an interior company and did I get that one Mm. oh no I didn't get offered that one either and then I had another one. So yeah, I must have had four. And I had another interview for like a, a fashion, kind of gothic fashion place. And I, you know me, as I've said, I'm a floral, bright girl. I'm not into gothic <laughs> <I> fashion. <guess>. So, <laughs> so it was just, it, I was so not passionate about it. I was like, that. this is going to actually ruin my views of fashion if I need to go into somewhere and like wear black lips that would be that would be like blas- blasphemy for you you're you're it yeah, really you're... would it would be like going against everything <laughs> I stand for so um I actually got that job so I did um I got offered it and then I got the job at Slater's which I was buzzing about and knew it was as soon as I kind of stumbled across the 
job vacancy I was like that that's the one I want like a big company in Glasgow it allows me to stay in Glasgow without the pressure of having to save up money and move away I can work in fashion and learn so much like about the industry and the positive is that because it's a menswear company I don't really have the comparison like say I work for quiz I'd be like that oh like not not steal ideas but I would maybe be influenced of what to do with Esperanza if I was working in a female like brand so being in menswear is just so different but I can also learn so much um my job is quite hard I've only been there like six weeks now and I feel like when you start a new job you are just so tired so I think that's why um Esperanza has kind of take a took a back seat like I've got so much to do that I just need to find time to do it and I need the weather to get better basically to have photo shoots <laughs> <laughs> and as we so on a personal level as we move through the easing of restrictions what are you most excited about on a personal level do you know what I would love I would love to be on a night out or a day out drinking and be like oh my god she's wearing Esperanza that's that's something I'm excited about <laughs> seeing people out that would be the icing what is it the icing on the cake if I've seen someone icing on the cake if I've seen someone wearing Esperanza because it's just so random like who buys it like I remember getting an order from someone who lived in I think I've not had many orders from England but just so random this customer from England and I was like she doesn't even follow me on Instagram I searched her I just don't know where she came from <laughs> like I don't know how she found me so that's exciting when it's people that like because my family have been so supportive like my sister's boyfriend's family have bought so many things and I feel like of course, it's great to get sales, but you feel they're, they're kind of like, dare I say it, like pity sales. So that's not great. <laughs> so when you get someone who like just randomly stumbles across your business, it's a really great feeling. So hopefully more of that in the future post-COVID when hopefully everyone is going to buy Esperanza things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I didn't have this one written down, but as I've thought about it as you were talking. Um, if you once you get to a thousand followers, are you going to get balloons? <laughs> You're going to do a balloon. <laughs> Either way, that is actually a really good shout. But do you know? I think I will keep it for the first birthday party and get balloons for the first birthday party, which will also be another Instagram opportunity. So yeah, and that would be a great day, like an Instagram. Uh, a long, uh, first birthday event I could post so many pictures but, but the restaurant has to match the new aesthetic it only need to be a pink restaurant now so if anyone knows any pink restaurants please let me know <laughs> Brilliant then that's, the, that's me work through all the, the questions so just to get you to plug your socials where can people find you and find Esperanza Style? So they can find Esperanza at Esperanza style underscore on Instagram um, and I also have the virtual styling account which is just at, at Colette Styling and that's really it. <laughs> the website sorry guys is www.esperanzastyle.com Fantastic. <laughs> that's you, that's me as well. Um, thank you so much. I ramble a lot I realize I ramble so much like see when you want to get to a point in the story and you just go in hundreds of different directions that's me no don't be silly um as I say thank you so much for your time and I'll speak to you soon but um yeah I'll see you later on bye, bye. and there you have it a massive thanks as ever to Colette for her time. That was an interesting insight into fashion and the grind involved in being a small business owner. Esperanza Style is on Instagram at Esperanza Style underscore and Colette's personal styling page is at Colette Styling. The website for Esperanza, as she mentioned, is www.esperanzastyle.com. All of these links are in the show notes. Let's get Esperanza over the thousand followers line. Usual bits and pieces from me to finish off. 
please follow at Lost for Words Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. You can support Lost for Words by hitting the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And if you are an Apple Podcasts user, a five star review means the world and it helps with the visibility of the show. Thank you all so much for your continued support and tuning in. I am your host Jason and this has been Esperanza Style with Colette Mullen. I will see you next week for episode 14 of the Lost for Words podcast.